everybody, welcome back. We got a lot of information this week that's gonna help us make better decisions next week that should lead to actually having an even more profitable week than this week, if you could believe that. And there are, is a lot to go over, so we're gonna jump right into it. First off, you can just see on the basics. Here's your weekly chart, W, and you just see the breakout, one, two, three. So let's just walk through these patterns so people can see that. You have two dojis up here where you have signs of uncertainty, and then you have the push which gave us the sign that we no longer have uncertainty. This bar completely encapsulates these two bars. You can see that pretty clearly, and this now becomes your support level. Now, it's not the greatest support level, but it's there. The most important thing about this week was that we've gotten some definitive answers, specifically on the econ front. Let's talk about that. Now, on Saturday's video, I like going through the week, and by going through the week, everything that happened and how we're gonna profit from it on the following week. So this is the formal, longer video, and then the, the weekday videos, add to what we go over this week for those that are new welcome but this is really important because we went over this friday morning in great detail this is non-farm payrolls and when non-farm payrolls comes in what we refer to as hot higher than expected what usually happens is the market sells down what i was explaining to everybody on that pre-market live which is public we do them every morning at eight o'clock this number right here the devil's always in the details like everything else here's the consensus so you would just go off the rip and say that this is higher but this number is made up of other numbers. So when you get into those details, that's where it gets really interesting. For example, the previous number of nine farm payrolls for government payrolls was 25,000 versus 70. Manufacturing was negative eight versus eight, and we were looking for six. On the consensus side for non-farm payrolls private, we were looking for 160 and we came in at 136. What people didn't understand at first and which provided us huge opportunity was that people thought that this was a hot number, or as we refer to a number that's higher, they are referred to as hot. We have CPI coming out this week, PPI. If it's higher than expected, you just say, oh, it's a hot number, meaning equity should drop. But sometimes the devil's in the details, and it was in this one. So if you understood that government payroll was the reason why this was up, it makes a huge difference because the government can stop and start anytime they want. Matter of fact, when they wanted to have a number come down, they did a hiring freeze for one quarter, and then all of a sudden this number zero and this number plummeted. Devil's in the details with this, guys, and that was very clear with what happened on Friday. For those that are new, I give actual techniques that you can utilize during the week to make decisive moves. And I'm gonna give you an example. You have CPI and PPI coming out this week. If you're not marking off that 8.30 bar on the one minute chart, you're at a disadvantage. And I'll explain why. You have the high of that bar and you have the low of that bar. You're gonna say, thanks, Rocky. But here's the important thing about that. That is where the algorithms and high frequency traders have put their demarcation line. So you can use that to your advantage. See, you are playing against these guys that are way more capitalized than we are. We all know that. And not only are they more capitalized than we are, they have more information than we do. And so they can move the market a lot more volatile than we can, being retail traders. What we wanna do is we wanna look at these areas of interest and then we wanna take advantage of them. Right? We want to trade with them, but we also want to take advantage. So if we know that this is where somebody said, I will buy everything you have on the ES, well, then that becomes a demarcation line. And then if you had known that around 10 times, you had a pretty interesting entry. If you knew that this was your level here where everybody was saying, I'm going to sell as much ES as I possibly can at 830, then when you break above that, you can tell by 1141 that you have a real move there. Now this goes two different ways as well, because not only can you do it that way, if you take a look at the NQ, for example, and you do the same exact thing, you can see here on the NQ at 830, I also put a 50% line in sometimes just to see if, if who's winning. So if you put a 50% line in, you can see who the buyers are, or the buyers winning, or the sellers winning. You always wanna know who's winning. Think about it as a sport. You know, Trading's more of a sport than people think it is. But if you come across here and you see, all right, we couldn't get up at 930, comes back down to that demarcation line at 947, and then you pop, now, what is this telling you? This told you two things. Number one, it told you that the NASDAQ was gonna be stronger than the ES. Why? Because the ES took till 10.30 to pop over. And you just go through them that way. Let's take a look at RTY for a second. So if you look at RTY, you can see the move. And then what did they do? They just sold it down all day long. So again, this tells you not only which index you should be playing in, it also tells you which index to be avoiding and it tells you when to play in which index. This is really pivotal. You might wanna watch that a couple times. Another thing I really like looking at longer term is I just like looking at the histogram. Now, the MACD histogram is just a combination of MACD. I just take the MACD out because it's too slow. The histogram's faster and gives you a more definitive position on what's going on. Since we flipped here and we went over this a month ago, 
I try to link all these stuff back. And I said, well, we're flipping. Well, since that flip, we've just had four weeks of just pretty decent growth. Even on your red day, you could just tell right here that, okay, well, the MACD is still aligned and things look good. Go and take a look at the NQ same way, and we can see that you have the same exact movement going on. See, the problem that we're dealing with now is people are saying the market's getting too high. That's like watching a ball being hit out of the park and saying it's too high, it can't be a home run. You just have to trade what's actually happening and stop telling the market what it's going to do. Your life will get a lot easier and your profits will go up, which is the goal of doing all of this. This is a cup and handle from before. What you can always do with these cup and handles too, and I, I do like to do this, I like to measure them. So what I mean by that is you just measure the size of the cup on a percentage basis and then think about it inverted. So you would just very simply, if you're like, well, how high, what is the measured move of this cup and handle break? And then you would just kind of go here and go, okay, well, that's 62%. So then from that point up, you could say that you could have a 62% move up. Now, this is a weekly chart, so you could be talking about multiple years. But what you're saying is from this line, you could see 60%. And again, you could be talking about years. You're not talking about weeks. And that obviously is gonna put you way, way up here. And it could be years before that happens, but that's telling you what the measured move is. And then you have the pullback, and then of course you left. But when you look at this histogram, you don't see anything wrong. A matter of fact, you actually see things getting better. And this is really important for people to get. So this in front of us is NASDAQ new highs divided by new lows. I showed this about a month ago and said, we're at trough valuation. What people don't understand about breadth is when they look at the year to date new highs or the 52 week new highs, new lows, and they say the breadth is weak, the breadth is weak. Well, you can only go so low. And then it has one of two things to do. You'll either go stagnant or you'll start to lift. And the point that I was getting at down here was that you were hitting trough valuations. And those trough valuations hit the same level that we had in October, November, which said, hey, we might want to start paying attention to this area. Now, nothing's ever exact. You don't know when it's going to turn. But if you're looking at this market and saying, oh, well, we're too high, we're, we're, we're up way too high, you're just beginning. This is just starting to broaden out. And this is important because some of the data you're about to see, we haven't even begun to broaden out yet. And this is a very important concept because as this gets better and better, the market will go higher and higher. And I think people are missing this. There's a, a couple of things that people are just not getting. And this is, in my opinion, one of them. To start with, you're comments or why I create this content, information, and education. Candidly, I'm doing a lot of this all day anyway from all, from all my trading. I've got my own way of doing things after 20 plus years of trading. But I do put this out because of wanting to get the education information out there. I want to truly take successful, to be successful in doing this. I'm not going to have time to edit this. Uh, but I want to bring the stool out because this was the stool that everybody loved the most. I've never got more comments on one of the stools than this. But Apparently, this is everybody's favorite stool. But again, understand how I view trading. I view it as a stool, and this is the top of the stool, and this is where the market makes its decisions. And sometimes the market leans this way towards the bar, and sometimes you're leaning back while you're having a beer, or whatever cocktail you're having if you don't drink, if you're having a soda pop, whatever. Do the kids still say soda pop? Anyway, this is the macro leg, this is the fundamental leg, and this is the technical leg. This always tells us the following. It tells us what, and then it tells us who, and then it tells us when. So this is the macro leg telling us what's going on. This tells us who's affected by this, and this tells us when. So if you think about it that way, and you just go, okay, well, what, who, when? Life gets a lot easier. Okay, they cut rates. Well, who, who benefits the most? Financial companies, they raise rates. They put on tariffs, they take tariffs off. Okay, what, what did they do? Who's affected by it? When do we buy it? Right, so the technicals are gonna get you there. If you think about the stool and the top of the stool, and I'm a visual learner, so I'm trying to, that's why we have the stool, but I'm a visual learner. So think about every investment bank that you know of, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, any name one. They're all set up the same exact way as the stool. They all have an econ department. They all have a financial department, a research department. They all have a technical department. So you trying to compete against them or me trying to compete against them and say, oh, I'm just gonna look at the econ because econ moves everything or all that matters are fundamentals or all that matters is technicals. I'm competing with the biggest firms in the world, with the smartest people and the most disciplined people in the world standing on a one-legged stool. I might as well just write a check to St. Jude's. It's, it's pointless. You need all three in order to compete. And you don't have to have the depth that they have because you're never gonna have that. But you need to have a general understanding of how all this connects to the stool so that you can make the more informed decision. I hope that explains why I do what I do. Now, 
if we take a look at right here, we take a look at copper. What you're gonna notice about copper is that you, you've made a U-turn. You're starting to lift again. Well, uh, always I hear Dr. Copper, copper tells us what's going on. Yes and no, but I do think copper's telling you very clearly here that we're going higher. Now remember what Taiwan Semi said. Taiwan Semi recently had a report out. Let's make this, let's do it this way. And this is peak VWAP. We might get into some of that today, but there's so many charts to go over that you need to just see how they're set up. Some of these charts that we're gonna go over, they're just set up so beautifully, it's crazy. If you take a look at what's going on here, well, what's the move? Why the U-turn? They came out and issued a statement, Taiwan Semi, saying, well, capacity utilization is going to double in 24. We're still in 24, by the way. Capacity utilization is gonna double in 24. And then after that's gonna double in 25. So if you think about it this way, and this is what's so neat to me, if I, if I go here and I look at this as a curve, right, and I take the curve like this, and I realize that on that curve, we haven't seen capacity utilization double yet in 24 for Taiwan Semi, which means the ramp up coming up is gonna be enormous towards the back end of the year. So the ramp up towards the end of the year is going to be enormous. That's what they're telling you. And then after they're telling you that, they're telling you, by the way, we're gonna double in 25. Well, we all know what sectors that's good for, semi, semi equipment, and we can get into that, but, this is important to get. In a world of uncertainty, we crave certainty. We just do. As traders, we want certainty. We want to know that we're right. And we never know. And that's the, that's the paradox of trading. But what we're getting here is a clear indication that demand in copper is coming. And I believe that it's coming because of the ramp up that's coming in the second half of the year. A matter of fact, I think that's why you saw some of the moves we're about to go over on Friday. But there's a couple reasons why they're buying the names that they're buying. But copper tells us a couple different things too. Now this chart is by Yordini. And I've been following Yordini since I've been trading. And the guy's sickly brilliant. Like literally, there's a handful of people that I would literally say that about. But the guy is sickly brilliant the way that he just views the world. A very different perspective. But he gives out institutional research. Some of his stuff you can actually just Google Yordini and find it online. Institutional research, things along those lines. I have permission to show these. But this is where he gets his data from, and that, that's who he is, and this is where this data came from. I, I love his work because it just gives you a different perspective. And so what's so interesting to me about this for you China bulls on copper is that we have seen this follow almost perfectly. And so whenever I see divergences, and if you watch any of these videos, you know I'm huge with these divergences. Well, what's this telling you? One of two things are gonna happen. Either China names are gonna go higher, okay? And then, or copper's gonna come down. Copper's not coming down. These, these kinds of comparisons are how we were able to get people in IGV two weeks early. If you've been watching these videos, you know I've been pounding the table on IGV, and you can see how that's it's gone. We'll get to that in a second. Look at this. And look at how this is playing out. This is this is huge stuff. It, there's there's another correlation. Now this one actually concerns me a little bit because this is copper. Here we go, copper and crude. And the reason that this one concerns me is crude is going to play catch up here, which means energy names are are going to rally. What I'm trying to figure out is how are, how is energy going to rally? This is what's always so fascinating to me, and we'll get to it in a second. But in 2003, I did this trade where I bought I sold oil in 2003, ask me how that went, didn't go very well, because of the Iraq war. And I'm like, oh, everyone's gonna have oil, it's gonna be so easy. And I never didn't understand like why Soros and all these guys were taking the other side of the trade. I understood later, right, when it went against, when it went against me. But we're, we're seeing the wrap up of some of the Ukrainian issues and even Putin today at the time of filming this was talking about, okay, things are getting a little bit better, we're getting closer to a deal maybe. And we're starting to see some of the uncertainty in the world go away. So we all think that crude's gonna drop for whatever reason it doesn't work that way, right? And and so what we're saying is we have this huge disparity here on crude oil between that and copper. And I think he does a really good job of spelling this out. Does it have to be side by side? And the answer is no, of course it does not. But at the end of the day, you need to be close, right? You need to be going in the same trajectory. And I think that's what you should be taking from this. Not that, oh, well, we're this far off of that level, but well, when this drops, this was dropping. When this was rising, this was rising. When this is going flat, this is going flat. When this is going up, and then you're like, huh, well, one, one of two's got to give. And I would lead that I think crude's going higher. We don't know that, but look at this for a second. This is energy. And if we take a look at energy, we're gonna see down here, as I'm gonna to refer to this as a cup, and then people are gonna tell me it's not a cup. But if you look at the, the neckline right here of that cup, and you look at the breakout, and then the retest, and the retest, you have this huge handle sitting right here. You've broken it, you've retested it, you've broken it, and then you've pushed. Now, it's not as pretty 
as some of the other cup and handles that I just showed you earlier, but it's certainly not as pretty, in my opinion, as this one. And I think that this is really important to get. You're gonna see pullbacks, you're gonna see retests of this handle, but this is setting up to live. And what we talked about earlier with the NASDAQ and the new highs, new lows, they're diversifying out. So not only are they diversifying out in tech, they're gonna diversify out in energy. Not only are they gonna diversify out in energy, they're gonna diversify out into what? Different commodities. That's where all this seems to be going. So again, if we take a look at the, the socks, right? And we go, well, the socks hasn't moved. Well, we know this because we've been saying that they're gonna start going into to different names. And then the question is, well, okay, so you're saying, because people always ask this, they're like, well, so what are you saying? It's just gonna be a bull market and you're just going to keep holding stocks and they're just gonna keep running? No, that's not what I'm saying. As a matter of fact, like when you start looking at this stuff, you're going to have to take it when you can. And then the question's gonna be, well, if you think it's gonna keep going, why do you have to take it when you can? And, and I'll get to that. Now, I do go over some of these concepts over and over again, and here, I'm gonna go with this guy with this skew graph, but it's important to get these concepts because you're competing against the smartest, most disciplined people in the world, and they get these concepts. See, you have to scale out of these trades when they're working because the skew's changing. Now, the skew, is re relatively simple. What this is, is just the SPX. And when you're in a tightening environment, which you have a negative wealth effect, right? You have high cash positions. You don't need ma massive hedging because you don't have a lot on. And tightening means exactly what it means. Tightening, raising rates. And then when you go through a period where the Fed is incentivizing you to buy assets, why? Because they're easing. And that's where we're heading. We all know it. And then you get a steeper skew. You can see from here, from 09, to 19, that this is what you, you had. And then from 2020, when everyone thought they were a genius, and then you start having 2023 and you'd start seeing how we're starting to change the skew color again. This is why the volatility is so massive and people don't get it and they keep thinking that, oh, we're gonna crash because of the volatility. Far from it. See, the volatility provides opportunity and this is something we traded in the community on Friday. We did quite well with the trade and you can see the breakout. We had it all marked off ahead of time. But if we look at this trade here, watch this. If you look at the skew, well, I'm in here at 71 and then at the end of the day, I'm at 81. Okay, so that's that's a good day, right? But at some point in the day, if you're buying this and you're not selling into this, how do you know you're not going to get this? And this is the rub. This is what people are missing. There is a reason why people wouldn't put all their net worth in technology names. And the reason was because the volatility was insane. People have not experienced this in the past three to four years, and they're about to. They're about to experience massive moves in tech, and then they're going to think it's over, but it's not over. It's presenting an opportunity. And in some cases, it will present an opportunity. In other cases, they're just going to get smoked. And then it's up to us to figure out which ones they are. But let's just take a look at something like an arm and just look at the volatility of that. You're like, oh, I'm, 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 I should probably be getting out long term. And then it drops. Oh, well, that was good. And then you're getting out here and then, you know, $30 in three days. This is this is the new normal based upon the skew. And that's why I'm saying when you see things like cost, you have to look at this and go, okay, well, am I really willing to go for that ride? Am I really willing to go all the way back down to 830? And my answer is no. See, in this kind of environment, you have to get out when the getting's good because you can absolutely have some kind of correction here. And I'll show you another reason why you wanna look at this. So if you're looking, like if you're in this name, right, and you start getting to something like a cost, and I'm at a third standard deviation band. Now I just wanna walk through what this is. This is just Bollinger Bands. And again, I pack a lot in these videos, so there's parts of this that you're gonna to wanna to watch. This is the median line on a Bollinger Band. What I've done is I've overlaid three different standard deviations on that band. And what you'll note is every time that you're over here, you're pretty much out of bounds. Now, why is that? Well, the first band tells you that you're gonna stay within a 67% range. The second one tells you that you should be within a 95% range. And this band tells you that you should be in a 99.7% range. So the probability of staying out of that range is what? 0.3%. Well, I'll take those odds every single day over and over and over again. And people will say, well, what about here? Okay, well, that's very different because these are widening and we can get into all that. But, you know, they're very different widening than when they're contracting. But we can get into that. For me, when I start to see this, either way, even if you bought here and this happened, nine times out of 10, actually 99 times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, you're better off scaling out of some of those 99 out of 10. So when we do this here, we want to pull it out. And this is this is a really important concept, guys. Now, right here is when we actually bought it in the community. That's when I put that alert out. I think it was May 
It's funny, people always say, oh, he just day trades. Far from it. About 25 to 35% of what I do is day trading. The rest is long-term or swing trading or special situations, optional options, mergers, and acquisitions. But anyway, see how you popped out over here? Well, we're in down here. And so now I've got an extreme move. So I wanna scale out into that. See, what you wanna to do to get outsized returns and that's pretty much what everybody's desiring, right? Everybody is looking for a way to get outsized returns. It's what it's what we all need. If we didn't need that, we would just buy the S&P and call it a day. If you look at this, I mean, Meta was something else that we did exceptionally well well on and, and pulled money out um, as a swing. This is a day trade. I actually should walk through this day trade because this explains why you don't want to be retail. I had a whole conversation with one of the guys in the room about this. Uh, cost, we were up $107 in two months trimmed and the stops just, you know, raised the stop and then we raised our stop to 841 on this for a couple of reasons why, but you can see, I mean, it's not rocket science, guys, you see why. But what we're doing is I'm selling as retail is buying. Retail's getting giddy, it's hitting all time highs. I knew I should have bought it. They're buying into a third standard deviation band. They're buying and I am selling to them because I'm in down here. That's how you need to think. It, it really is, you need to stop thinking like retail and you have to start thinking about how you're going to how you're gonna to sell to retail. You know what, I, I wanna walk through this coin trade now that I think about it. Cause I, there's no, I don't think there's a better example of what I'm trying to explain than this and how this ties into the SKU as well and how you should think about trading. Now in front of us is this account that I have linked to the Alpha Chasers community, trades that I actually do in there. This account's really aggressive in trading. So when I show you this, just understand that. It's a super aggressive account the way it's handled. A couple of misnomers. People always think that you're supposed to have like this huge win rate. Let me click, ah, yeah, I can see the yellow better. So my win rate year to date right now is 54.19%. My average win is 1.58, profit factor of 187. Every time this I do a trade, it's $270.59. I get asked how many trades I've done. Um, I got asked that thousands that are in this account. This is a very aggressive day trading account. So I think we started the year at a buck 60 or a buck 70, something like that. And this is the result. The reason I'm starting here is this win ratio. People think that everything you do is gonna work. It's not, it's why you use stops. So keep that in mind. It's a really important distinction. All right, so now that we've prefaced what this is supposed to look like, and I did that for a reason, this is not normal. And you, you need to understand that this is not normal, that you're not gonna constantly look like this. It's important to get that. All right, so you can have a PL like this, obviously, but my trade expectancy in the, in the little bit of trades that I've actually done and executed in this one account, again, I, have, I trade several accounts at once, but this particular account, I compartmentalize, and this particular account is very aggressive. This is not gonna happen all the time. This 71%, it's not gonna happen all the time. And you just have to realize, and this is why it's so important to journal everything that you do so that you can have an actual snapshot of what I'm gonna to refer to as reality. I would love it if this lasts, but there's something, again, called reality and it's not going to. A win-loss, 176, but the profit factors through the roof, you know, 1.5 is just insane and this is your trade expected. So before I showed this, I wanted to show the other so that you get it, okay. Now let's go look at this trade on coin. Now the trade on coin was interesting because the majority of retail wanted to short. And I'll show you a conversation I actually had in the room when we were discussing how we were gonna map this out. We actually came in short coin and I'll show you that in a second. But we see this move right here up over the test, the retest, and I actually added twice in here. I actually fired in, then I had it work and then I knew I was right, or I knew I had a high degree of probability of being right. So I added to the trade, scaled out, scaled out, scaled out. And what I'll do sometimes with these trades is I'll add one to pair out of, and then I'll add one to hold longer term, and then pair out of that one as an all or none. That's what I did here. So different strategies, different times. But when you look at where to get out of this, just take a look at this, and then you can kind of see you know, why we started to get out, when we got out. And what you'll see right here is you can just see that level marked off, and that was the low of the previous day. And then what I'm doing is I'm scaling out into all these. One minute, a little clearer. So I'm not waiting to see if this holds or it doesn't hold, right? I'm scaling out positive slippage into this. And you don't wanna put yourself in a position where you're waiting. In other words, you wanna be getting out. You wanna assume the worst. You wanna assume it's gonna fail. Right, so I'm scaling out, I watch the test, the retest, and then that was it, it's time to go. Whether you're doing this over a long period of time or you're doing this intraday, this works. And this will increase your risk versus return ratio, like through the roof. You wanna get out, and if you learn one thing today, the one word is positive slippage. Now, this is also really important. So this is the conversation that we were having in the morning. And the conversation in the room was, are we shorting the Bitcoin mine? And this is just a gentleman that's in the room. but. 
The purpose of the conversation was this. If we do this, then we're doing what everybody else is doing. So we're talking, discussing, should we short the miners today? And my response is no. And earlier in the week, we bought a bunch of puts. I didn't walk through that trade, but we did quite well on the drop down on it. We were buying puts when everybody else was on the other side of it. Why would I do anything? We just like everyone else. You have to stop thinking like retail. If you do what everybody else is doing when you're day trading, you're gonna get the results that everybody else gets. 96% of people that day trade lose money. I don't wanna do that. I wanna do the opposite of that, right? My comment was, why do I wanna be like everyone else? My mom told me I was special, just because I'm hysterical. And if anything else, we should close the short, which is what we did and look for a gap bounce, and that's what we did. Now, what that did was, we just watched it, we watched the rally, we watched the retest, and then we got in, and then we got out, and people would say, well, you didn't get this. I don't need that. As long as I'm getting the meat of the move, let's get into it. Now, we're all aware of the economic data that recently came out, but there's more going on under the hood. So this is the aggressive curve steepening. This is a source from Bloomberg. Bloomberg put this piece out, and it's really fascinating when this is happening. So I want you to pay attention to this date, October, November 2023. I want you to note when you're seeing the spread wide. Now remember, this is just basis points. So while people are not really digging into this, I think they did a really good job on pointing this out and there's value here and I'm gonna explain why. So we got uncertainty here and we got uncertainty because we had this political debate and it just didn't go very well one way or another, but it created way more uncertainty and we're gonna leave it at that. That's what it did more than anything. It definitely triggered something and I'm, we're gonna walk through that, but there's also economic uncertainty or is there? And that's what people, I think people are getting confused by. So the uncertainty that's being developed right now, it's political but it's also because if there is going to be a new person in the White House, and that does affect all the different policies that are going on out there right now, what is that gonna do? So what do they do? The yield curve inverts. Now, if the yield curve inverts, just stay with me, and it's widening, then a widening yield curve is supposed to mean what? Recession. If this is going to lead to a recession, we've been in one now for what? about two and a half years, because we've been inverted now for over two years, since 2022. Where I think it's leading it to is, I think it's leading to way more uncertainty across the board. But I do think that certain parts of this are starting to become way more certain. But this presented an opportunity here, like it did here. And I'm gonna explain this, but just stay with me so you can get, get to this. First and foremost, we all are aware of the ISM data that came out and the ADP data that came out on non-farm payrolls. We're all aware of that. We're all aware that ISM was one of the lowest readings that it's ever had in a long time. And that's not a good sign on the services side. And it does mean that prices are dropping. And that was the one thing that people were looking for. Matter of fact, we saw that the chances of a rate cut actually did what? They spiked in September. I think they're at 70% right now. But for time's sake, let's stay on point. Consumer price index versus unit labor costs. Okay, so what they do is they say, unit labor costs in blue, okay, that leads CPI on the monthly side. Right? And then this shows areas of recession. Now it's my belief that what they're gonna do eventually is just highlight a gray area somewhere around here after they revise numbers. But that's me and my tinfoil hat. But this is what I have to deal with. So I have unit labor costs, units of labor costs, exactly what it says, headline CPI, exactly what it says. This is by Yardani Research. Now, what he does is chart these two, and it seems like a pretty good idea, doesn't it? Because if you look from the 50s on, it's pretty clear that one has led the other. Now, I'm not saying that one drops as far as the other. Certainly, that's not the case, because we can see that. But we do follow the same trajectory. So, if this is dropping, and this is going up, then what we're going to see eventually is CPI come down. And I think that that is not being misunderstood not being taken into account, that things are actually going to start getting more deflationary, which is what we saw in the statements from the Fed minutes on Wednesday. This is a very important concept. It's my belief that things are going to get more deflationary. This will lead to rate cuts. The understanding that rate cuts are bad is not really where my head is, and I'll, I'll show you why in a moment here. This is Bloomberg, and what they do is they have an earning surprise, meaning if we have econ, is there a surprise? If so, what kind of surprise? Is that surprise to the upside or is that surprise to the downside? In this case, it's showing that since 22, in general, we're getting surprises to the downside. And it's showing where we're at now and how we're just essentially falling off a cliff. And I think that that's really important because this solidifies 
that we are seeing deflationary environments and that we are heading into an area where they are going to cut rates. As a matter of fact, let's take a moment to see what they said in Fed minutes because I think this is pertinent. FLMC takes a playbook out of the earnings call. It's just something I put on Twitter as I was reading the notes. Participants highlighted a variety of factors that were likely to help contribute to disinflation. That means prices coming down. The factors include easing demand, supply pressures, lagged effects of wages, yeah, we just went through the labor market. Prices of past monetary tightening, the delayed response of measured sheltered prices, rental market developments, meaning they think rents are going to come down, additional supply side improvements, less demand. The latter prospect includes the possibility of a boost to productivity associated with business deployment of artificial intelligence related technology. So they are talking about AI and they are talking about increased productivity and how that is going to lead to an deflationary environment, which will allow them to cut rates and not have to worry about it because they're gonna to get to that 2% time and when they do, they do. And I don't believe that he's in a hurry. If he is, we'll probably see something in September. Now, we keep hearing that rate cuts are bad. Now, instead of reading the like the blurbs that you'll read on social media, I always find it good to actually just read data. And here's Bloomberg. And Bloomberg, this data is from Morgan Stanley Research. Their point is we're gonna take historically the start of a Fed cut. And we're going to say, what happens to a Fed cut? And they took from 73 to date. Here's where it gets interesting. If I am to look at this environment, 84 to 89, you had increased productivity and they cut rates and we were just fine. A matter of fact, every quarter you were up. If you take a look, every single quarter you did well. Right? Some were better than others, obviously, but they were positive. Now, if you take a look at 95 to 98, when they did this, not only were they better, but they got ex exceptionally better. And why do I think this is important is for a couple of reasons. What we're going through right now with AI, in my opinion, nothing is closer to one, than when we started doing the internet and really getting involved on in the internet. To me, it really reminds me of when we were trading Netscape back in the day and trying to figure out what it was and how people were gonna make money from it. Nobody really understood it. And now today, no one could live without Amazon, for example. This is pretty fascinating stuff. And I would suggest that if you are increasing productivity, which they suggest that we're going to do, you're going to increase productivity. At the same time, it's going to be deflationary, which the internet certainly did. And AI is leaning that way. And I'm not gonna bore everybody with all of it but it's definitely leaning that way on a productivity side, making things a little deflationary. If that is the case, then I do expect us to have an environment like this. And I do think that we're seeing some signs prematurely of this, and it's why we saw the move in the market. Now, that little move happened before in October, end of October, 2023. Let's review something. As I stated, we had a period of people being concerned and you're not only gonna see this, I'm gonna show you that investment advisors are also concerned and they don't know what to do. And I'm gonna show you data to support that. But what we're seeing here is VXTLT and VXTLT very simply is treasury bond ETF volatility. And this is pretty good just from a treasury standpoint because what they're suggesting is based upon Thursday is they're suggesting that things are gonna get more inflationary, not less inflation. And let's just go on the assumption that nobody knows, or we can even go on the assumption they're right. I, I really don't care. What we're gonna do is just look at the, the disparity here. We're gonna look at where TLT is and we're gonna look at where the VIX is. And what we're gonna notice is that that is extremely rare to have that kind of spread between those two. And then what we would do is we would go look for an area where you had a similar spread. Now this spread between these two over this period of time on a percentage basis is one of the largest in 10 years. So the swing of this I think might be greater than the swing in what I'm about to show you. I don't know that, it's just my thought. But if you were to look at this, you would go, well, we don't do this. We did this once before. And then we'd go back to that spread that I showed you on the first graph and realize, well, that's when that spread happened on the two and the 10 spread. Now in front of you is November 1st. And right around it starts in that third week of October, right when that spread was that we started with the first graph. And look at this disparity between these two, between the VIX, VX, TLT, and the VIX. And look at the disparity in here. And look at how long that disparity lasted. And look at when that disparity started getting together. When did we reach an equilibrium? Well, right around March 1st. Okay, so what happened to the equity market between end of October in 2023 to mid-March, or let's just call it March 1st. We can even go in here, end of February, March 1st. Let's take a look at the equity markets. Now in front of us, we would see here, and we're just gonna mark this off. And that'd be that third week in October. And then this is when the Fed met. And then since then, what happened? Well, you'd have to go in that disparity went to, let's call it mid-February. We'll call it mid-February here, or we could call it mid-February to in here somewhere. All right, so we'll just, 
We won't take March 1st, we'll take to here. This entire move happened while VXTLT and the VIX had that huge disparity. That whole move happened while VXTLT and the VIX had that disparity. And then when that disparity got back to normal, what happened? We saw it start to you know, have an equilibrium and come back. We now have that situation again. I think that you're going to be mistaken if you don't pay attention to this. I'm not suggesting that we know what's going to happen. What I'm simply suggesting is that when we look at how this played out in the past and we'll review it again, what we would note is that we did see that disparity and that disparity happened at the same exact time. Now this is where people will say, well, correlation doesn't lead to causation. And I, I agree with that. So the cause of this might not be because of that, but it could certainly be because we thought one thing and then something else happened. In other words, in November, somebody thought something was gonna happen and the Fed changed their tune and boom, once they changed their tune, well, then things were out of whack. Just like here, we thought we, one thing might happen and now they changed their tune. This uncertainty is not just in the bond market. And I think that's a really important part for us to, to get out there. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking at this and saying, okay, could we see some semblance of clarity in this getting back together? The answer is yes, we could. How long? I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. What I do know is that this disparity led to something else that created a huge move. And this level of uncertainty that we're seeing, this level of uncertainty we're seeing in something that is very certain. In other words, we know that rates are gonna go lower. We know this. We can see it in the economic surprise data and how they're dropping. We can see it in all the data I just went through with you. So we know that this is going to drop. We know other countries have cut their rates already. We know that this is where we're going. And we know the outcome of this in an environment with increased productivity, because we watched it in the past 40 years, two specific times in the 80s and 90s. But what we're seeing is we're seeing people don't know what to do. And this is really where we can profit. In front of you is data from AAII. Now, AAII is the American Association of Individual Investors, nonprofit. Basically what they do is they take data from people that are financial advisors. And they basically, guys that do financial planning, retirement accounts, market portfolios, that kind of. And what they ask them, are you bullish or bearish? They rank them and then you come up with a number. What you'll find is you usually find some level of correlation. For me, it's always when they are the most, right? That you actually, you know, will see this kind of stuff, right? Just the way it is. It's the exact opposite. They're actually contrarian. And what matters is what they're doing based upon what we just saw. And you're saying, what do you mean? Well, we just had this huge move in the VXTLT based upon Thursday. We have this economic data that's saying one thing. We have the bond market selling off and then rallying. And then we have equities that are going higher. And that swing is something that we can measure. And I'm going to show you how to measure that swing in a moment, but this is always why I talk about watching the bond auctions and why they're so important, especially now. Everything goes in waves. You just have to remember the stool. But look at that number. So we have less bears because of what happened last week. We have less bears on the because we have that economic data that came out. You had the obviously the reaction to the uh, election or not the election, the you know the debate. And you know whether you love it or hate it, whatever, I don't care. But at the end of the day, you have less bears because of that. So that must mean we have more bulls, right? Actually, no, you have less bulls. So you have less bears and less bulls, which means what? They had to raise, there's only one thing to do in that case, you're gonna raise capital, which means you're gonna raise cash. Now, if that's the case, we have this spread, we have bulls that are saying, well, I'm not getting in the market because of, you know, the, the way this debate went and how bad this economy is getting. And then I have the bears saying, I'm not getting in the market because of how bad things are and because of this and that, and the debate, inflation. And then I have this disparity and this spread all around the period of uncertainty and a shift in market sentiment that we've seen here before. And then we've seen how this shift affects the market. Hopefully you can see how this is all connected. I'm bringing it home. Now, what we want to focus on is what does this all do? What does this all mean? So let's take TLT for, and let's look at TLT and let's put this in a, candlestick chart. So again, we have an event, the event happens, the market drops off, the market responds to the event, and what are they starting to do? They're starting to buy what? They're starting to buy bonds. So at the time of recording this, it's 7.3. But they're, they're starting to buy bonds. Okay, if we overlay that with the SPY and the dip that we saw here because of that, and now we're hitting new highs, what's gonna start, what's gonna happen when they start buying bonds again? What's gonna start happen if the AAII starts getting bullish again? All this is overlaid, and this is, this to me is what's so fascinating about this. All this is overlaid, all of this is overlaid in an environment where 
you have very low volume because of the week. Nobody trades this week. Nobody in general trades this week. I, I have hammered this home over and over again. The past week is not a big week to trade. And what they did was they took advantage of that. They took advantage that nobody trades this week. And what they did with it was they bought the market. I think that is extremely telling that because what they like to do is they like to move in secret. And I'm talking about institution. You would think that you would go sideways to down and go nowhere because we're being told everything's going to be more inflationary going forward because you know, we're told, well, earnings aren't really going to be that great. We're being told this over and over again. I'm going to show you a slide in a moment here that actually shows how the Magnificent 7 or 8 are trading at a discount. And it's gonna, I think it's mind blowing when you really look at the data. This is what we're being told. And then we're also looking at this going, well, this is historically the worst period, why? Because of buybacks. Well, take a look at this. Now, there are three major buyers of equities, right? You have your institutions, you have your corporations, and you have your retail investors. There's, they're the three major groups. Out of those groups, one has a window where they can act or not act, and they are corporation. On 612, 50% black, blackout, okay? Then this week that just passed, you're at 90. Then it goes to 94 is where we're going to be. So right now you're at 90 up here, and then you're gonna to go to 94% is where we go next week. That can't buy. So this market's moving up without corporate buybacks. I'm just gonna say that again. This market is moving up and being as violent as it is with all those big names moving with no corporate buybacks. Now, well, maybe corporate buybacks aren't a big deal. I'm glad you asked. So this group is by, this is by Yordini and LSEG data stream that put this out. And what this is showing is S&P buybacks and billions of dollars quarterly. If you take a look at that number and you realize that you're talking with a B, if you think that's not a big number, it's a huge number. A matter of fact, this quarter is the third biggest quarter of buybacks on record. And none of that is going on right now. So when they are able to buy their own stock back in the open market, do you think that there's going to be more buying or do you think there's going to be less buying? And that ties me to my next point. Do you think they're going to reinvent the wheel during this market or do you think they're gonna buy what's working? They're gonna buy what's working, why? because it's working, right? Why would you rethink what's working and what's not working? And even in that case, someone's gonna make, I'm gonna show this and it's gonna be mind blowing because you're gonna be like, how can you say this is at a discount? It, it, it's historically at a discount from where the peak is. You'll see in a moment. But on pace for record low percentage of stocks beating the S&P, okay? Only 25, isn't that crazy? When you think about this number on a percentage, like look at this, percentage of stocks outperforming the S&P, 25%. You're telling me a hundred names are outperforming and that this is the weakest it's ever been since 74. This is as bad as it's ever gotten and it's only gotten worse. So do we think that this is gonna get better? Are we just assuming that it's going to reverse and they're gonna start broadening out? The answer is yes, eventually they're gonna to have to, right? You will, but you're gonna to have to get to a level first. I'm gonna show you the level that I think you need to get to before that happens. This was really in depth and I tried to connect all the dots. If I lost anybody anywhere, just comment below, let me know where I lost you and I can fill it in. But this is the kind of research that people need to do so they can kind of figure out where the puck is going and not get the same results that everybody else is getting. But if I did lose people in this, just comment below. Some people will watch this two or three times and then they will take notes. All right, let's get to the fun stuff. The graph in front of us is from Yardini Research. And I thought this was really fascinating. This will show what they refer to as the mega cap eight and includes Google, Amazon, Apple, Meta, Microsoft, Netflix, Nvidia, Tesla. Both classes of alphabet are included. And what they're doing is they're taking this period of time and they're doing it on a percentage basis, meaning percentage of market cap of share of the s and And if you start here, you would say, okay, 10 years ago or 12 years ago when this started, we were right around that 7% and now you're at roughly 32%. To me is important about this is all the growth that we're currently seeing in the market, all of it is coming from these names. And it's not even just coming from these names. It's not really coming from Tesla. And this is something that we're gonna address when we start looking at these charts, because I do think it's important that we review all of these charts technically, what's happened over the month and the week, and really pay attention to the, the behavior of them. So we're gonna spend a lot of time on that. But I want you to understand that this is beyond unprecedented for these eight stocks. And the question is, how long could this possibly go on for? And there's another slide that he does an excellent job of. Now, I'm a huge Yardini fan. I've been watching this guy for 20 years. He's probably been at it 40 or 50 years right now. Sometimes some of his PDFs are actually online for free. Some of it you have to pay for. I'm able to show this. I made sure of it. But the the thing for me about his work is it's just very objective. Hey, this is where we're at. 
do what you want with. So the mega cap eight right now has a PE forward of 30. And this is somewhat important because People are thinking, oh, well, geez, it's through the roof, it's so much. So if I was to say to you something along the lines of, well, I understand that the PE is, you know, 30.87 right now, and that pre seems pretty excessive. And then you go and say, well, at the peak, we were at 39%. Now, stay with me. What I'm getting at is this. Just to start, I'm getting at This is when the PE was 39. The PE here is 31, roughly. So you have a disparity here of about 20% in PE expansion, and we're here. So when people are saying, well, how long could this go on for? Well, to even equate to the same earnings and the same peak excessive move that we saw, from here, you're 20% away. So if you think about something like that, and you're at 31, then you'd be looking at 37 or 38%. That's extremely excessive excessive and I'm not gonna say that it's not, it's actually unprecedented, but it's also a discount to where you're at. And the issue that we're seeing is, when this is where people are missing it, they're not understanding that the growth out there right now is coming from eight companies. If you took out 494 names right now, out of those 494 names, you would have negative earnings. Now, we are starting to see a decline, the comps for these eight names, but what I'm getting at and what you should be wrapping your, your noodle around is this. While people will say, well, this is excessive, this can't go on, well, you're not even where you were in 01 or 21 rather. You're not anywhere near that. It doesn't mean you have to be there. But when you're saying the words excessive, his point is, well, you're not even at, at peak levels yet. So can this continue? And I would argue that yes, this can continue and it might be a reason why we're even seeing it move even more in that direction this past week. Now we've covered a lot of ground today, but the important thing that I think you should really take away from it more than anything is that we need to focus on the leaders. I don't think that that's gonna go away and I don't think that we should change the way that we're viewing. I don't think anything could be clearer than even what you saw with Tesla on Friday, where you just reversed like you were gonna drop down and then you formed a hammer at the end of the day. The gaps in here, the volume that you're seeing in these moves is pretty significant, guys. I mean, this is not small volume. This is not mom and pop. This is institutional buying. I mean, you're doing 200 a day at some, some of these days, 200 million shares a day, it's a lot. And I don't think that that's gonna stop with the leaders. So if you look at these leading charts, and I know a lot of people are saying, oh, well, they've just moved too much too fast. You could make an argument for six months that Meta's been in a base. That, that's an argument that could be made. Now, do you have to get in on a, you know on, on Monday morning? No, I, I, because you're, you're down here at 510 and now you're like, okay, well, we just moved 30 points. What I'm suggesting to you is that when people are looking at these and saying that they're overvalued, I don't think they're looking at them accurately. I, I, I truly don't. And when you start looking at these charts and what happened on Friday, most people are going to look at this and not understand why. You're going to understand why this is happening now. And then you're going to understand the ability of this, if this can continue or not. And that's really important. So what I would do is I would not focus on when it ends. I'd be focused on, hey, I need to look at these charts and I need to be setting up key levels on areas to get in. And then I need to be getting out when the getting's good. For example, the people that are scared to buy Microsoft or Meta or any of these names in here, even Netflix, they're the people that are gonna struggle because what they're gonna do is they're gonna go look at where, the, where, where are we going next? Where could they possibly be put money in next? And I'm not saying that that's not a game, but you have to look at what are they doing right now and why are they doing what they're doing? And there's a reason for that. I would just go back and watch some of these slides because again, this thing was absolutely packed with information. This video took hours to make. Again, I'm doing the work anyway, so I don't mind doing it. It just fails on the editing side, but if you find value in it, please send it out, please share it. But you have to look at these charts and go, okay, well, I'm going to say that Apple's just going to stop. Well, again, you, people could be making an argument that, well, you were basing for a period of about a year. And so, and that's a valid argument here, don't you think? I mean, I think it's a valid argument to say, yeah, we've been in a, we've been basing for about a year here. And for this to break out now, it's really not, you know, it's not crazy. You've been in, in this trading range. And then we broke out, we did the retest, and now we're going higher. I don't think people are grasping this concept. So the other thing that you could always think about is this, and this is in regards to the FNGUs of the world. And I'm gonna link this, this video at the end. I want, I want you guys to watch this video, this price action video. It's one way to trade. I got a lot of really good reviews on it, and um, I'm gonna do another one. I have someone else helping me with it. But you, this is FNGU, and this is the top 10 names out there. And people would look at this and go, oh, well, I missed it. Okay, well, this is the peak in 01, and this is where you're breaking out on the 3X ETF. Do you think that you've, you've missed it? You know, are you getting the best price? No. Am I saying that you should be looking at buying this thing Monday morning? No. 
What I'm simply suggesting to you is, is if you're not looking at where they're putting the money, then you're going to be the one that's behind and you don't want to be behind. So you're going to have to look at these names and go, okay, well, this is where they're putting their money. It's very, very clear that this is where institutions are going. It's very clear this is all going on while we're in the blackout window. So two things are going to happen. You're going to go into earnings, which are predicted to be very good across the board. And you're going to go into the buyout window where these companies can get their own stock and buy their own stock. So you have two positive catalysts and at the same time, they're moving like this. So by setting up your intraday levels, you can find other ways to get into these names. And I think that that's what you're better off doing instead of sitting there and saying, I missed it, or I'm going to go look at these names that haven't moved yet.